Hey, good evening, everybody. Pam, nice to see you. Johnny, Nancy, Diane, uh, thank you guys for joining tonight for our third episode of Travel Talk Tuesday. Then tonight, we're concentrating, jumping way across uh, the Irish Sea to Northern Ireland, on the very north coast of Ireland. You, know, you realize that uh, Ireland are, is a big island, and on that island are two countries, the Republic of Ireland, which became uh, independent from um, the UK, from England, from the, Brit, from the Brits in 1922. And uh, then there were six counties up in the north of Ireland that uh, remained part of the United Kingdom. And with that, uh, it, it, the, the island itself was split apart and there was a border there from 1922 until um, the early 2000s where you actually had to cross and there were armed guards on the border and, uh, and that type of stuff. And uh, so the first time that I traveled to Northern Ireland, uh, driving in from Dublin up to Belfast, I recall uh, having to stop at a checkpoint with a military um, person being there. And, um, you know, just like you see in some of the other places in Europe with uh, armed guards and everything else. But this was more because it was between the two countries and it was because of some of the troubles that they had had throughout the previous decades in the 70s and 80s as far as uh, with the IRA and uh, with, the, with the troubles between the Protestants and Catholics and whatnot. So uh, that's what we're kind of going to talk a little bit about today. I decided tonight to fix uh, some traditional uh, brown bread, Irish brown bread, and also um, well, I cooked up a fresh Irish beef stew. Charlotte made sure she, uh, that I didn't put lamb in it, so uh, it's got beef in it, and uh, so I, I'm, that's been cooking in the crock pot all afternoon. Let me just show that to you real quick, and then we'll get on with this thing. So, the soda bread... It's the first time I've ever done this, but it turned out great, the brown soda bread. And those of you who've been to Ireland, you know this is gonna taste great. This is Kerrygold butter from way down in the Republic. And so we're gonna have some of that. I'll, I'll have some of that as we go on. And then, and then the stew turned out great. Let me just... It's got, I cooked it in Guinness, um, you know, Guinness, I cooked it in the Guinness, and it's the stew here, and uh, it's, it smells wonderful, so I'm going to give it a taste, too, while we're watching this video, but that's what we're doing, and, and we, Guinness is not a Northern Irish beer, it comes straight from Dublin, the Republic of Ireland, but it's so good that everybody in the, on the island drinks it, so that's great. So the first thing you see here is a map of Ireland, the whole island, and it's a map of my trip around Ireland with the Best of, Best of Ireland tour, beginning in Dublin, and it goes around in a counterclockwise or a clockwise manner. And so we're going to be talking about this area up here uh, that has Londonderry or Derry, Belfast, and six, in six counties up there. Okay, so folks, thanks again for joining us tonight on Travel Talk Tuesday, and my guest is from Northern Ireland in the Belfast area, and her name is Susie Miller, and uh, so welcome, Susie, to tr uh, Travel Talk Tuesday, and uh, I think the first thing maybe we're kind of interested in is how are you coping with the pandemic there in Northern Ireland? Well, it's been uh, a very quiet year. Um, right now, as of uh, the start of this week, we're just coming out of another lockdown. So Good. it meant that all the hospitality, which would normally be thriving as we come up to Christmas, was all locked down um, until uh, just a couple of days ago. So people are getting back out into pubs and restaurants, but it's all very controlled, social distancing, contact details, all of that sort of stuff. Uh, so, you know, we're, we're in and out of various stages of lockdown here. But um, the government has been trying to get something together so that people can at least have a sociable Christmas and can uh -huh. see friends and family. So they're allowing three households to get together for, for Christmas celebrations. 
um, you know, it would be a very quiet time here anyway, normally for, for tourism, because the days are very short. Uh, sure. But, uh, you know, it's getting dark by, by 3.30. Wow. Uh, this time here. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the swing on that, the upside is that when we get to June, it doesn't get uh, dark till about 11.30 midnight. So <laughs> that's when you've got to soak up all of those, those rays and that. Yeah. Day, so you can store it away for this time of year. But yeah, you know, we're, we're coping, uh, we're hoping as, as the vaccine starts to roll out and we had the first vaccinations here in the UK um, just a, about a week ago, uh, that uh, things are going to turn a corner and that we'll be welcoming visitors back here in the sort of, I would guess, late spring, early summer. Mm -hmm. Great, wonderful. Well, speaking of that and welcoming visitors back, um, I know that the United Kingdom is going through uh, a exit from the European Union and is commonly known as the Brexit and uh, you guys being part of the United Kingdom but being on an island with the Republic of Ireland or of Ireland then there's there's two countries right there Northern Ireland and Ireland and the borders are very very soft I think but how how are you coping with that what's going to happen come uh, the 1st of January I think when when rules change I wish I had a magic answer for that. Oh, no. It's just so confusing. Um, the Prime Minister Boris Johnson has been locked in negotiations over with, with the folks in Brussels uh, for days and days now. And, uh, you know, we're still waiting for a clear uh, path as to how this is all going to pan out. I think, you know, for the average visitor flying into Dublin and maybe coming up to, to Northern Ireland for a vacation, they won't really notice any difference. It's for things like goods and, and you know transportation mm -hmm. of, of, of livestock and meat and things like that that um, Northern Ireland is having a few problems. You see, way back when all this first emerged and um, we had to vote for, for Brexit, goodness, how many years ago is that now? It's, it's, it seems like decades. <laughs> um, you know, nobody really sat down and thought, well, wait a minute, we've got a piece of the United Kingdom which has a direct land border with another EU nation. And we need to, to treat that a little bit differently. Sure. So now that it's coming back to, to sort of bite <laughs> yes. in that you know they never really considered how this had to be treated. And even all this far down the line, uh, there, there still are no clear hard and fast rules as to how it's going to work. So we're just really feeling our way. Mm -hmm. um, hopefully, you know, within the next few weeks, um, something will emerge which will tell us exactly how it's going to work. But, you know, I know, for example, I'm going to be flying back into Dublin in days in sort of March time, and I don't even know what queue I'm supposed to get into, which line, you know, my EU, I've still got an EU passport. Right. Yeah. Uh, Northern Ireland has this sort of dual identity thing going on, where you can hold both a British and an Irish passport. Mm -hmm. So it's all a bit confusing. I guess you just pick the line that's the shortest. Yeah, that's a, that's the a thing that we do as a, from the United States. Uh, we can get in either one, I think, going into the to the EU, especially. <laughs> well, we'll be keeping in touch with that because uh, I know a lot of people are interested in that. But as far as us being tourists from the United States, it's not going to affect anything. We could cross the border freely. Uh, there might be a checkpoint or something, probably, but uh, uh, it's it's not going to affect us and our travel and our tourism, I don't think. I, I don't think so. You know, under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement back in 98, so this was to be a, a soft border, you know, between Northern Ireland and the Republic. And your, your incoming president, Joe Biden, has been very keen that the uh, conditions that were set down by the Good Friday Agreement should be adhered to. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I can't see a situation where there'll be passport controls, but there may be sort of random checks from time to time. I guess, uh, you know, if you're driving around in a rental car from south to north, uh, here in Ireland, I can't see you encountering any problems at all. But yeah. you know, maybe just have the passport handy just in case. Sure. Yeah. Well, it'll hopefully, be no worries for any of us, and everything will work out in time and due time. Um, I know you're very closely connected uh, to the uh, the Titanic, and the Titanic was built um, there in Belfast. So give us a little, a brief little history about that and, and how, it, how you're connected by your family to that. Sure, yes, um, the, the Titanic is, is one of the things that we're very proud of here in Belfast and it might sound strange to be proud of a ship that supposedly was a failure that sank on its maiden voyage, 
But uh, we see the whole Titanic story as kind of the entryway into all the engineering and the innovation that was going on here in Belfast back in the, uh, the 20th century, the early part of it. Uh, which unfortunately is all gone now, but you know we can look back with pride to what was being achieved. Titanic was the biggest man-made object ever moved when she came off of the slipways at Harland and Wolf, mm. which is just about a mile from where I'm sitting right now. That's and um, you know we, we have embraced this story after many years of really not talking about it. Uh, when it came to the centenary in 2012, we really felt that we needed something to show tourists and visitors to our city. Uh, what was this all about? What was the actual story of the Titanic rather than the Hollywood interpretation of sure. it? So within that, um, I take tours around the sites which are important to Titanic, but in particular, uh, because my great-grandfather was one of the crew of Titanic, I like to tell his story and really bring it to a personal level. Um, his name was Thomas Miller, so he's my father's father's father. And he was the assistant deck engineer on board Titanic, uh, which means that he would have been up on the deck looking after things like winches and cranes and anything mechanical up on, on that part of, of the ship. Uh -huh. And he was he was one of the crew, so you know he, he wasn't on a ticket. And um, his plan was that he was going to relocate to New York City. His wife had died a few months earlier and left him with, with two young children. And uh, he felt the best future for them as a family would be over in the States where all these opportunities were opening up. And so that's what he did. He, he signed up, uh, left Harland and Wolf where he'd been an engineer and signed up with White Star uh, to go over to the States and, and be an engineer based over there. Mm -hmm. uh, unfortunately, he did not make it. He, as one of the crew, obviously, he would have been helping passengers and other people yeah. onto life boats when, when she struck the iceberg. So he wouldn't have had much chance at all of, of making a, a getaway from that situation. Um, but you know we're we're very lucky with with his story because a lot of it was left behind. Uh, my grandfather was only five years old when all of this was happening, but he was absorbing it all and listening to what his father was saying and remembering it. And he had the good sense to write it down when it was still fresh in his head. So we've got a very complete picture of of what were the last words that. Thomas Miller said to his children uh -huh. before he left and things that he gave them and, and his whole sense of pride in being involved with the Titanic project. So um, it's a nice way to, to personalize what is such a, a well-known um, universal story. Yeah, and it's uh, for those who uh, can go and visit Belfast, it's well worth uh, signing on to one of your tours because there's such a personal experience involved in that. Uh, the whole complex of the Titanic experience, the, the walkthrough exhibit and everything. Uh, just give us a brief description of that. Sure. Um, it opened back in 2012. It's, it's a big, shiny, spiky building, very modern architecture, which tells the story of, of Titanic's construction and why she came to be and how she was built and of course of her maiden voyage. Uh, so that's kind of the centerpiece to a lot of stuff to do with Titanic that, that is very authentic and genuine that you'll see nowhere else in the world. Uh, so for example, we have the, the tender ship that used to take first and second class passengers out to Titanic, wow. which she called it the French uh, port of Cherbourg. That's sitting right alongside Titanic. Ah, okay. um, so you know you can see something and then walk in the footsteps of, of some of the most famous Titanic passengers, people like Molly Brown, for example, um, right by Titanic Belfast as well, you've got uh, what used to be the old Harland and Wolf headquarters, so the shipbuilders' headquarters where the ships were designed, and that's now been turned into a hotel. And you know, you can walk through, I can take people mm -hmm. through and show them where the draftsmen would have sat and, and designed wow. ships like Titanic. Thomas Andrews, who's one of the most famous figures um, on the in the Titanic story, uh, where he worked. And, and you really get that sense of history, you can smell it, you know, it, it just yeah. feels so real. And, you know, they, they've made a little trail now, so it's called the Maritime Mile, so that you can actually walk um, right down the slipways where, where Titanic and her sister ships were built, uh, down to the dry dock where she was fitted out, and, you know, you can really extend the story. Uh, so, yeah, there's, there's a lot more as well as, as Titanic Belfast, which is really the shining centerpiece in the middle of it all. Um, I'm very lucky in the past couple of weeks I've actually moved house and I've moved into the home of a guy called Roderick Chisholm who in 1912 was the chief draftsman on Titanic. 
So not only do I have that uh, that family connection, now I'm living in the house of someone who was lost on Titanic, and you know you can just when I'm walking out my front door, I can imagine him leaving here on in early April of 1912, heading off on, on Titanic and thinking that he was going to see his family again in a couple of weeks. And of course, never coming back. So mm. th there's a great sense of, of connection there with, with where I'm sitting right now. Yeah, sure. Um, what about uh, what other um, attractions or uh, venues are there available in Belfast for, for tourists? Beyond the Titanic, there, there's, there's so much. I mean, we're kind of known for the two T's here in Belfast, the Titanic and the Troubles. And, mm. you know, the, the Troubles, recent history in the 60s, 70s, 80s, the, the civil strife that, that was happening here in Northern Ireland is a, is a very hard thing to interpret and so, you know, it's, it's there but a lot of people choose just, you know, not, not to get into that. Sure. Um, it's there if you want to, to go and explore it or have it interpreted. I used to be a, a TV news reporter reporting on those events during mm -hmm. the 80s so I have a, a sort of particular insight into yeah. to some of yeah. that ever happened. But I, I think that what a lot of people don't realize of, about Northern Ireland is it's, it's got so much natural beauty. You know, they tend to think of, of mountains in the highlands of Scotland as being the go-to for that if they're visiting the UK. But here in, in our little corner, we have some absolutely spectacular coastal scenery up around uh, the, the north coast, the Atlantic coast. Uh, the Giant's Causeway is something you might have heard of. It's mm -hmm. a rock formation, very unique uh, geological feature. Um, of hexagonal stones that, that it's, the myth is that it was built by a giant called Finn McCool so he could go and check out Scotland back in the day. Yeah. So you could believe that one or you could go with the boring <laughs> volcanic if you want. Um, but it, that whole coastline is, is somewhere that is just spectacular. We don't necessarily have the great weather for it but um, it's still worth going out and seeing. And it, it kind of made the headlines back in 2019 because of uh, the British Open golf, which was played at Royal Port Rush. Uh, so I, I think some people around the world who weren't familiar with the North Antrim coast got to see some spectacular scenery, at least on TV, for the yeah. first time. You know, we were kind of hoping there'd be a bump in tourism because of, of 2019 and, and <laughs> golf being here, but of course 2020 put paid to that. Oh, yeah. So let's hope that it lives in people's memories and they think you know, if they're a golfer, that it might be somewhere they want to check out. Right, that's a beautiful area through there. Uh, then we have, um, we can't uh, leave the area without talking about Bushmills, which is a town. <laughs> and uh, many people don't even know that's a, a town until you get there, but uh, it's also famous for the uh, for the, the whiskey that's brewed there as well. So uh, yep. that's, that's nearby the the area of Port Rush as well. Um, yeah. That's, that's the oldest whiskey distillery, licensed whiskey distillery in the world. 1608 they started. So that's right, okay. Craft up there. So, yes, it's, you know, even if you visited countless whiskey distilleries in and around Ireland and Scotland, Bushmills mm -hmm. has that unique selling point in, it, in that it is the oldest. And they've really been increasing their range of stuff over the past couple of years. You know, so they've got this, what they call the steamship cask, is a new product they have out. Um, you know, it's it's very different. It's it's not like the the, the peatiness that you get from some Scotch whiskies. It's okay. Like that. So yeah, definitely worth it. Yeah, and it's worth it's worth a stop you know, when you're when you're in the area to go by and do a tasting, and uh, you really get an education on how it's distilled and how it differs from other type of whiskies around the world. So it's a great experience uh, to do that there. Definitely. Well, I think uh, we've caught up a lot about what's going on in Northern Ireland. We hope we can come back and visit sometime soon. Uh, uh, you know, I've got some tours scheduled to come over in June, July. I'm hoping that uh, that all works out and we can visit the Republic and Northern Ireland as well. And uh, my gosh, thanks Susie for taking the time to, uh, to join us today and be a part of this. I really appreciate it. It's, it's a pleasure, it's a pleasure, and we're really looking forward to, to welcoming visitors back to Northern Ireland, hopefully uh, later in 2021, so definitely come and see us. Yes, I hope, I hope to see you later in the summer of next year. That'd be great. Thanks so much. Let me stop it here just a second and um, mention to you that 
there really is a different look and feel to Northern Ireland, more of a feel, not so much a look, uh, because, you know, the, the countryside and the mountains and the seaside and all of that look the same as they do in the Republic, but the people are really a bit different. I mean, I don't know if you pick, this is the Giant's Causeway, as you can see. I think I'm still, I'm still sharing the screen. Hi, David McGuffin here on the far north coast of Ireland at the Giant's Causeway. I hope you enjoy this 60 second look around. This is a magnificent example of God's handiwork. Geologists say that some 60 million years ago, when the earth was forming and the Teutonic plates were breaking apart, that a lot of the eruption happened in this area. And over a course of many thousands of years, these ball site columns formed as the Earth's core, which had been pushed here, were dry. taking a track today on the Ulster Coastal Footpath. It's uh, kind of near the Giant's Causeway up on the north, very north coast of Ireland. I hope you enjoy this look around amongst the sheep and the fish and the birds and, of course, Finn McCool. The house of death was the perfect The next two excerpts are actually not in Northern Ireland. They're just across the border in the Republic in a region called Connemara. And um, these, this is a, a, a castle uh, called Kylemore Abbey, uh, which was the home of um, a, a rich land, English land baron. And Jeff here at Kylemore Abbey. I hope you enjoyed this look around an ancient monastery and a manor house. By the way, let me just cut in because um, many of you know that I was a band director for a long, long time 
And the music that you're hearing on this uh, was composed by one of my band students uh, back in the day, Reggie Bailey. So both of these, uh, these tunes, this theme song that I have, uh, and the other piece called Beats uh, was composed by him and we were just kind of brainstorming in the band room uh, one morning during a percussion class and uh, kind of worked out the theme. So that's where it came from. A little trivia that I don't think I've ever shared with anybody. So anyway, Reggie, thank you. I hope you maybe you'll see it on Facebook and get my accolades. Good job, man. From Calmore Abbey, your adventure starts right here with David McGuffin's Exploring Europe. This is the last one. <laughs> These are the gardens about a mile away from the Abbey. These gardens were planted in the late 1870s by Mr. Mitchell Henry for his wife. It's one of the massive gardens here on the estate. That's peat, by the way. Peat fire. Thank you guys for being here. I hope uh, you enjoyed a little look around Northern Ireland, and hopefully you'll join me next week, okay? Great.